Located on a 20,000 acre ranch in the wide open spaces of northeastern Wyoming, UCROSS offers uninterrupted time, along with workspace and living accommodations, to competitively selected visual artists, writers, and composers to create, reflect, innovate, and dream while surrounded by unique, majestic landscape. Passes around. Probably wondering why we've gathered you here today. <laughs> the faculty subjects gathered at the UCROSS residency and found that Jeff Lockwood, the man behind the curtain of the UCROSS pollination experiment, would be tasking them with daily assignments. The closest approximation of what we're going to actually do. It is subject to change with very little notice, but it's not like you're going anywhere, so... Uh, <laughs> So what the heck? I'm a staunch advocate of assembling good, creative, collaborative, and smart people, and then giving general ideas about the game and letting them play. On the first full day, each employed their specialized academic superpowers to explore the landscape. You know where we are? No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks. That rock was that rock over there before it got cooked. And it's by lightning started coal seam underground fire. Exactly. Geologist Ron Frost identified clinker rock formed from the underground burning of coal seams and called clinker for the distinct clink sound made when the baked rocks are walked on or struck by a rock. Poet Harvey Hicks sat on one of these formations to pen in his journal. Biologist Michael Dillon, a specialist in bees, found the bees. There's stuff happening here. Choreographer Rachel Shaw observed the movement of grasses. Composer Anguzo extracted sound from found objects and natural landscape. Crickets and ants on it, but... Shrub ecologist Ann Hild found solace in the sagebrush. Sculptor Ashley Carlisle was surrounded by three-dimensional inspiration. And microbiologist Naomi Ward. Well, I'm just collecting a few examples of things that might be interesting from a bacteria point of view. So I've got some dirt. Um, I've got some dried grass. These guys right there. And now I'm going to try to get a little bit of this lichen. Organizer Jeff Lockwood moderated evening discussions to foster dialogue between the environmental arts and sciences. What do the artists find out about the scientists and the scientists find out about the artists and each of us find out about ourselves? How might the professors, who so easily view the world through their own academic perspectives, co-create with one outside of their discipline? So I'm excited that this is the first time that I'm being able to focus on my home here. In days following, participants had the opportunity to explain their experiences and observations to the group, a crash course in their disciplines, and an opportunity to share their passions for their own specialized fields with others. So, this is the grass. This show and tell camp activity included microbiology, range management, choreographic notation, and a geological history of the Rocky Mountains. I cannot look at landscape and not see the geology, not see the geologic history and landscape evolution and stuff like that. I'm envious because you have that knowledge when you drive through Wyoming. Mm -hmm. I want to know it like that, you know? That's a really neat thing. Camp counselor Lockwood then paired up each scientist with each artist to see how they might interact. It's a, it's a challenge for me. To, um, to open up to those larger forms. Not building large or any of those things, because that's actually pretty normal for me. I mean, I take little minuscule things and then make them the size of you. Now you can so, take pretty big things and make them small. <laughs> well, that's what, yeah, that's what, uh, that's, you know, a consideration for sure. Soon the pairings were announced. Each pairing would be tasked with presenting something of value to a public audience 10 days later. The biologist would work with the choreographer. The shrub ecologist would team with the sculptor. The microbiologist would pair with the poet philosopher. And the geologist and composer were tasked to create something of value. 
Would the pairings result in something as grand as the formation of the Rocky Mountains? Ron Frost and Ann Guzzo put creative energies together. Could it be possible to explain the geology of the Powder River Basin through music? Gravity finally wins. The rock above the coal seam fails. Fractures race to the surface. Oxygen streams in. Hits gases from the coal and the flames that roar like a blast furnace. Frost worked on the libretto, comprised of technical geological terms, the first opera anywhere to be written in geolese. Could radical integrations of art and science occur? Products that would debut in a public forum? Clearly, Jeff Lockwood thought this was possible. You know, we've got several more days. <laughs> I know, we have at least two hours to finish an opera. <laughs> I was trying to head for this sentence right here. Your favorite. My favorite, which is pyrometamorphic anatexis in surrounding P lights. So, I wrote down the rhythm of that. Uh -oh, because okay. cause you were saying that it needs to be this, it has to be rhythmic, right? right. And it, these words just fall off the tongue like that. Pyro Pyrometamorphic anatexis in surrounding P lights. The circulated lithic polymictic breccia known as clinker. Although in the operatic version, I think it's going to be known as clinker. <laughs> <laughs> was this work or play? It was summer camp after all. How might they recreate the sound of clinker? In a fit of creative energy, the two headed to the recycle bin. How's that? Perfect, this. huh? In one of the most unusual Saturday universities sponsored by University of Wyoming, the four pairs of artist scientists premiered their achievements. When you're writing an opera, you want your characters to not only look different and be in different voice ranges, but have different styles of music. So the Powder River, the soprano, is, is beautiful and hopefully very tonal and moving. And the clinker, the uh, burning coal, is atonal and jagged and rough and abrasive and cutting. So that's the idea here. And clinker sounds like that, okay? It, it, its name is... Um, I'm about it. On a, yeah, because here's the sound. So this is going to be an instrument in, uh, in the percussion section in the final opera score. The bucket o' glass. <laughs> it's a technical term. There's, there's only so much of an opera you can write in two days. <laughs> okay, deaf. Um, this, one, this one, though, will give you a sample. Ann Guzzo and Ron Frost had achieved the goal, a deeply collaborative work that integrated their scientific and artistic disciplines to achieve something larger, something of beauty, something that would not have been born without the U-cross pollination experiment. But would these collaborations continue beyond the confines of the experiment? The, the communicating in new ways is is really what's going on, right? Yeah. And the, with that comes new audiences, for me. Like, I'm pretty sure that music majors don't know how the Rocky Mountains were formed and how <laughs> Flinker <laughs> happened. <laughs> right. uh, I right. mean, yeah, I, there's a 99.9% .9 chance unless they've had your class, <laughs> you know, that they don't know this. And even then, I don't know that that's something you teach in your class. Not Clinker. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, it's a way to, to just practically speak to more humans. A month later, two arias premiered at the John Galt Coffee House in Greeley, Colorado. Performed by the Colorado Chamber Orchestra with water as the soprano and the burning coal seam as the tenor, the geological story was told in spectacular fashion.